Today we're going to be looking at the next stage of our series called By Faith. Now, do you remember the people we've looked at so far? We had Abraham, and then we had Jacob, and today, you probably have worked it out, uh, we're going to be looking at the story of Joseph. Now, the title of my story is not Why You Shouldn't Sell Your Brother. Okay? Or party all the time. time. But the, the title of my message today is Do All That You Do With All Of Your Heart For God. And if you don't remember anything else from my sermon today, I want you to at least remember this, this line, Do All That You Do With All Of Your Heart For God. But before we dive into the story of Joseph, I want to look at a couple of verses in Colossians. Now, in Colossians, Paul is writing to uh, this this new group of of believers, and he starts talking about human relationships. He begins with husband and wife relationships, how the the wife is to relate to the husband, how the husband is to relate to the wife. Then he starts talking about more the family relationships, fathers um, and their children. And then he starts to talk about a, a sort of relationship that, for many of us, might seem fairly foreign, but for the world in which Paul was writing was a fairly um, well-understood topic, and that is slaves and their masters. And evidently, there must have been a number of slaves in this church. And you can imagine if you were a, if you were a slave, there would be a degree of bitterness that would usually be shown towards your master. All your freedoms are gone, and you're serving for someone, and everything you do is being dictated by another person. And for those slaves there at this church, Paul has this advice. He says, Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything and do it, not only when their eye is on you and to win their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. So not with bitterness, not with hostility, not with a grudge, but he says to those slaves, serve your masters with sincerity of heart, with earnestness, with passion, with zeal, and reverence for the Lord. It goes on to say, Whatever you do, work at it with all of your heart, as working for the Lord and not for men. Isn't that a radical thought? For these slaves to take their slave master and in their minds almost pretend that their master is Jesus. Jesus who died on the cross for them, Jesus who... um, forgave them, and all of that love that they have in response to Jesus to work for and to, tr- and to serve their master with that same sort of zeal- zealousness and zeal. And so summarizing that verse is what we came up with for the title, Do All That You Do With All Of Your Heart For God. Now I wonder what that would look like if we applied that principle to our day-to-day lives, in our workplaces, in our schools, Um, when we're just going about our day-to-day activities, if we applied this same principle to our life, I wonder what would happen. And the answer is really seen in the story of Joseph. Now, before we dive into the verses in in this story, I want to give you a bit of a, a family profile of Joseph. Now, this is something that is often not talked about in the children's stories that we've grown up listening to with Joseph, and that is the the messy, quite chaotic family that Joseph was born into. And it all began with with Jacob, and we talked about Jacob two weeks ago. And Jacob fell in love with, who was it? Rachel. And he loved her so much that he worked for seven years, and they seemed like only a few days. And that was our message a a couple of weeks ago. However, when he woke up the morning after the wedding... And he looked over to his wonderful bride. Who did he see? He saw someone else. Uh Uh-oh, this is not a good start. And so the one that wasn't um, stunningly beautiful, but the one with weak eyes, which we talked about was actually supposed to be a positive thing, Leah was now his wife. And Jacob then talks with with Rachel's father and agrees to work for another seven years to marry the one that he always wanted to marry, which is Rachel. Now, imagine you are Leah. How do you think you're feeling at this, at this point? Are you feeling loved? Are you feeling like you've got a, a, a good place in this relationship? Or do you think this is a bit of a recipe for a bit of hostility? 
Now, the, year, the months go past, the years go on, and Leah begins to have some children. In fact, she has four children, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. Now, children was a big, big deal back in those days, and it's, it's a significant, significant thing today as well, but especially back then, Leah suddenly became the one having children, and Rachel was unable to have any children at all. And so there's this really interesting dynamic where Rachel's the favorite one, but Leah's the one having all the children, and there's, this, there's just this recipe for tension that begins to brood there in this family. Now, Rachel starts to get jealous of Leah and comes up with a plan. Hey, Jacob, take my servant, Bilhah, and have children with Bilhah, and that way I can start catching up to Leah. And so Jacob does this, and Bilhah has Dan and Naphtali. Now, Leah sees that Rachel is catching up. The score is now four to two. And so she thinks, well, Jacob, take my servant. And Jacob's like, okay, I'll have a fourth wife. <laughs> and so Jacob gets Zilpah, and Zilpah has Gad and Asher. And then Leah starts having more children and has Issachar, Zebulun, and a daughter by the name of Dina. Now, how do you think Rachel is feeling at this point? Overwhelmed, 11 children, but she's been unab unable to have any. And for Jacob, Rachel is the favorite. And it's not until right down towards the end of, of Jacob's life that Rachel finally falls pregnant and gives birth to a person by the name of Joseph. And then a little bit later, Rachel also has a second child by the name of Benjamin. And in the process of giving birth, Rachel actually dies passes away. Now, you can see how issues of favoritism begin to um, find themselves in this family, can't you? Okay, and you can see how Joseph began to emerge as the favorite in Jacob's eyes, because he is the oldest of the only woman that he really wanted to marry in the first place, Rachel. And now Rachel has passed away, and Joseph is, is what he has left of his bride, Rachel. Now, to make matters worse, so, so this family was, was characterized by favoritism, hatred, jealousy, grief with the death of Rachel, but things got worse and worse. And we're not going to go into all the stories connected with this, with this family, but there was sexual abuse, revenge, and violence. I'll tell you one of, the quick, or those, one of the stories. Dina, there was a man by the name of Shechem, and I'm sharing this because it's going to be significant shortly. Shechem took a liking to Dina. And he ends up raping her. And Simeon and Levi, in retaliation and revenge, actually go to the city where Shechem is and end up slaughtering all the males of the entire city. So you can, you can see that this was not exactly a, a harmonious family to grow up in. And so Joseph finds himself in the midst of all of this chaos and turmoil. And, and so why is this... Why do we... Why is this helpful to us today? Well, firstly, it shows us that whatever situation you find yourself in, God has a plan for you. God has a plan for you. And it also shows us a bit of the dynamics that led to the situation that we're going to read about now. So open up your Bibles to Genesis chapter 37. Genesis chapter 37, and we're going to begin in verse 3. Genesis 37 verse 3 says, Now Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his sons, because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a robe of many colors. But when his brothers saw that his father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. So Joseph is the son of his old age, but it's not spelled out here specifically, also the son of his beloved Rachel. Okay? And all the other brothers are taking... Uh, you can imagine Leah would have just been feeding this jealousy and this hate and, and this hostility into the other sons as well. And they take this hatred towards Joseph. Let's jump down to verse 12. It says, Now his brothers went to pasture near father's, their father's flock near Shechem. 
And Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. And he said to him, Here I am. So he said to him, Go now, see if it is well with your, with your brothers and with the flock, and bring me word. So he sent him from the valley to Hebron, and he came to Shechem. Now, why do you think Jacob was a bit concerned about his sons hanging out in Shechem? Okay, so you remember Shechem was the individual who had raped their um, sister Dina, and they'd gone and they'd slaughtered all of the men of this city, and now they're pastoring the flock there. So Jacob, understandably, is feeling a little bit nervous. And he sends Joseph off to see how they're going. And, and it wasn't just a short journey there. It was around about 100 kilometers. So this wasn't just go around the corner and find your brothers, but this is a long journey and possibly quite a dangerous journey. And you can imagine Joseph was probably pretty eager to finally make it to his brothers in this land where it's probably very dangerous. And eventually he finds them, not in Shechem, but in Dotham. And we pick up the story in verse 18. It says, They saw him from afar, and before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. Now, it's inter- I like looking at this story from both sides. So Joseph, he's, he's gone, journeyed for 120 kilometers at this point, because he's gone to Dotham as well. And he sees his brothers, possibly a bit nervous about seeing them, but eager to be around family. But his brothers see him, they get this plan, and they conspire to kill Joseph. Now, many of you might be familiar with the rest of the story. They end up throwing him into the pit. Um, Joseph, uh, I mean, Reuben then tries to, to step in to save him. Um, he gets his robe torn off him, and he's put in the pit, and he's left there uh, to die. And this is when they start having a little bit of... They start coming to their senses and they realize, you know what? We're not going to get anything out of killing Joseph in this way. Maybe there's something in it for us. Let's go to verse uh, 25. It says, Then they sat down to eat. And looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels bearing gum, balm, and myrrh on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, What profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother, our own flesh, and his brothers listened to him. Then Midianite traders passed by, and they drew Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. They took Joseph to Egypt. Now, can you see, how is this pretense of goodwill here? Oh! We're his brother. We can't kill him. Let's make some profit out of him. And so they sell him for just 20 coins, and off Joseph goes into the unknown. Now put yourself in the shoes of Joseph. What are you feeling? Betrayed. I love that word, betrayed. He must have been feeling unloved, okay, because... Apart from his father, everyone else in this family is against him. Worthless. He's just been sold for 20 pieces of silver. Now, that might have been a fair bit of money back then. I'm not 100% sure, but and for your, to be sold for that, divide that amongst us, just two shekels each, he would have been feeling worthless, controlled. All his freedoms are gone. Now he's going into this controlling situation. He would have been grieving his, his father, the loss of his father, fearful of the future. Helpless, hopeless. How can someone serve God in the midst of all of that? Would it be easy? It would have been easy for him to make up all sorts of excuses. Maybe I'll, this, this is just too hard at the moment. I've just got to focus on survival. Let's put God aside for the time being. Maybe... Um, He could have got angry at God. Why has this happened? There's all sorts of excuses that Joseph could have thrown against God why he he could push God aside and no longer serve God. But but how could he, he serve God in the midst of all of this difficulty? And I want you to remind I want to remind you of our verse at the beginning that we looked at. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything and do it 
not only when their eyes on you and to win their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord and not for men. Now, with all of these emotions inside of Joseph, it would have been very easy for Joseph to serve with a chip on his shoulder. Do you understand that phrase, a chip on the shoulder? For those who might not understand, it means to seem angry all the time because you think you have been treated unfairly or feel that you are not as good as other people. Now, it would have been very easy for Joseph to be feeling this way. But let's read through what Joseph does. And as we read through, I want you to be, ask yourself the question, is Joseph serving with a chip on his shoulder or is he serving with some other sort of passion here? Let's go to verse 39. In chapter 39 and verse... One. Chapter 39, verse 1, it says, Now Joseph had been brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, had bought him from the Ishmaelites who had brought him down there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him, and he made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. From the time that he made him overseer in the house and over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in house and field. So he left all that he had in Joseph's charge, and because of him, He had no concern about anything but the food that he ate. Does this sound like someone serving with a chip on his shoulder? Or is this someone who's serving with devotion, with integrity, with enthusiasm, with excellence, with passion? And it's amazing what takes place. He goes from being the lowest of the servants to being a personal attendant to Potiphar. He goes from that to being over all of his house to eventually being over all every single thing that Potiphar has. And Potiphar says he only has to worry about the very things that he eats. What an incredible story. Joseph did all that he did with all of his heart for someone much higher than Potiphar himself. Because Joseph isn't just serving Potiphar, he's serving God. Now, this whole idea of serving God as opposed to your human master or your humans, what does that really mean? What is, that, what is really involved in that? And I want to suggest that we need to realize that in everything we do, we are representing God. Now, this is something that I get reminded of every time someone asks me of my profession. Just recently, my wife Kylie and I met some people just in the community and we were playing a game of basketball with them. And towards the end, at the end of the, of the sort of game, they started asking like, oh, so what do you do? And we started sort of getting to know each other. And I said, oh, I'm a pastor of, of uh, one of the local Seventh-day Adventist churches. Now, whenever I say that, my mind suddenly thinks back to all the things that I've done, all the things that I've said, all of the, was I being super competitive? Was I, and I start thinking of, How have I represented God? Because once they realize that I'm a minister, suddenly I am now in a position where the things that I do, the things that I say, are actually communicating a message, not just about who I am, but about the person that I represent, which is God. And this is true not just for me, but it's true for all of us in all of our situations. From the moment you wake up, you hop in your car and that person pulls over right in front of you or tailgates you behind, behind you and... Whenever we take the name of Jesus as Christians, we are representing him. And we are communicating a message about our God with every single person that we interact with. It reminds me of 1 Corinthians 10 verse 31 which says, So whatever you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And in the situation of Joseph, that was exactly the effect of the work that he did there. God was glorified through his actions. And we see this especially in verse 3. Chapter 39, verse 3 says, 
His master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. Here we see in this foreign land, through this earnest, sincere service that Joseph is doing, Potiphar, who was a very important person, comes to know about the Lord of the Israelites, the God of the Bible. Now, let's remind ourselves of our key phrase, do all that you do with all of your heart for God. I wonder what would be the result I mean, I wonder how we can, could know if we are living this out effectively in our life. What would be the results of such a life? Would it be like Joseph? Would we be promoted right up into the highest of positions? Would suddenly everything go our way? It's important to continue reading on in this story. Let's go to verse 6. Okay, Genesis 39, verse 6. It says, so he left all that he had in Joseph's charge, and because of him he had no concern about anything but the food he ate. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance, and after a time his master's wife cast his eye on Joseph and said, lie with me. Uh Uh-oh, things just got a little bit trickier here. And it's very interesting the phrase that used to describe Joseph here. He was handsome in form and appearance. Do you remember how they described his mother? Rachel? was beautiful in form and appearance. And in the Hebrew, it's exactly the same. Like mother, like son, Joseph was an attractive man. And Potiphar's wife takes a liking to him. Now, I love the way that in Patriarchs and Prophets, it describes this situation. It's Ellen White writes and says, This temptation, so sudden, so strong, so seductive, how should it be met? Joseph knew well that it would be the conse- what would be the consequence of resistance. On the one hand were concealment, favor, and rewards, if he went along with this temptation. On, on the other, disgrace, imprisonment, perhaps death. And he goes on to say, his whole future life depended upon the decision of, of the moment. Is that a lot of pressure? I wonder how often we find ourselves in situations where we make decisions and our whole future life depends on the decision of that moment. And it says, would principle triumph? Would Joseph still be true to God? And I love this last phrase, this last sentence, I mean. With inexpressible anxiety, angels looked upon the scene. Can you just imagine the invisible host of angels just watching this scene? What is going to take place in this moment? Let's read on. Uh, Verse 8 and nine, it says, But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, because of, my master ha- because, me, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in the house, and he has put everything that he has in my charge. He is not greater in his house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except yourself, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Now, here we see this interesting little clue into the thinking of Joseph here. Yes, um, Potiphar has put him in charge and entrusted him with great responsibility, but he says, how can I do this thing? And he doesn't say, and sin against Potiphar. He says, and sin against his God. Who is Joseph ultimately serving in this situation? He's serving God. And it's interesting that when you are serving God, it is irrelevant if people are watching or not. Because the one that you answer to, the one that you are serving, is the one who sees every single thing that you do. And so Potiphar's wife thinks she's going to get Joseph by getting him alone and getting him by himself. But it makes no difference in Joseph's situation. Now the story continues on and... um, and, and Potiphar's wife gets him alone, and eventually he has to run away. And just he, the temptation gets so difficult, he just runs. And Potiphar's wife is left with the cloak in, his, in, um, in her hand. And twice now, Joseph is stripped off from his coat. And she calls out to her guards, Come quickly, Joseph has tried to, to rape me, essentially is what um, she is saying. 
And then they come there, Potiphar finds out about it, and the situation gets much, much worse. And we find this down in verse... Uh, where are we up to? 30, chapter 20, verse 20. 39, verse 20, and it says, And Joseph's master uh, took him and put him into the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in the prison. Now remember, I asked you the question, what is the result if we do all that we do with all of our heart for God? Will it be promotion? Maybe. But the thing is, we can't just rely on our immediate surroundings and our circumstances to be the test of how faithful we are being to God. And sometimes you almost get the sense when he is like in charge of the prison that it must be in a fairly relaxed prison there, and it must be in a fairly comfortable prison. But when you read in Psalm 105, which is describing Joseph's experience here, it says his feet were hurt with fetters, his neck was put in a collar of iron. Okay, is this a comfortable situation? Okay, this is the lowest point in Joseph's life at this stage. He's there in prison. He, he shouldn't have been a slave in the first place. And then he didn't do anything wrong. And now he's in prison. He could have just got such an incredible grudge. And, our, and so we learn that our experience is not a reliable measure of our spiritual success. And that's a really important thing for us to remember. In prison, what's going to happen for Joseph now that he's in prison? Verse 21. It says, but, uh, but the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it successful. Now, we... Many of us have heard this story many times, and so often I think it's easy to, to not realize the significance of what is happening here. Joseph is a prisoner, and he is running the prison. Like, he must have had a key or something. He must have had every opportunity to escape at this point. He's in charge of the place. Could it be that he was doing all that he did with all of his heart for God? And... But what do you, how do you get to that position? How do you go from being with a, a collar of iron around your neck to being in charge of the place? Now, a little insight is given to us in Patriarchs and Prophets, and it says, he did not brood upon his wrongs. How easy that would have been to do. But forgot his sorrow in trying to lighten the sorrows of others. He found a work to do even in the prison. Is there any place that, where we can't serve God? Even in the prison, he found a work to do. Joseph gradually gained the confidence of the keeper of the prison and was finally entrusted with the charge of all the prisoners. And this tells me that every situation we can possibly find ourselves in is an opportunity to serve God. Chapter 40, verse 1. Now, we're coming close to the end of the story here. Sometime after this, the cupbearer of... Sorry, chapter 41, verse 1. After two whole years, Pharaoh dreamed that he was standing by the Nile. So two years has passed, and Pharaoh has this dream. He sees these seven skinny, skinny calves... Come, sorry, seven fat cows come up out of the water. Okay, and then followed by, following them was seven skinny cows. And, and then he has a similar dream about wheat. And... And he has no idea, and it's, and it's so similar, this situation, to the situation of Nebuchadnezzar. I'm not sure if you've looked at the parallels between those two stories before. But here we see Pharaoh is, is just so desperate to work out what the meaning of his dream is, and he calls all of the wise men of Egypt. And they come and they present him, themselves to him, and none of them can give any sort of meaning to Pharaoh's dream, when eventually the cupbearer and the, um, the baker remember person back in the prison who had helped them to that situation and Joseph is called in. And it gives a little insight into the way that Joseph was caring for the other prisoners in the prison. In those situations, you, can, you imagine Joseph, he went down beside the cupbearer and the, and the, the baker and, and talked with them and so what brought you here? How are you going? 
Um, how can I help you today? And here's this story. And, he, and through caring for them, he ends up finding himself before Pharaoh himself. And because God had given him the gift of, of understanding dreams, he shares to Pharaoh the meaning of his dream, that there will be seven years of plenty followed by seven years of famine. And then at the end, Pharaoh does the most incredible of things. And we read this in chapter 41 and verse 9. Again, I just want you to, you've probably heard this story a number of times. Some of you may not have heard it before, but if you've heard it before, just try to really see it from a fresh angle this morning. Uh, 41 verse 9, and it says, sorry, we're going to jump past that section. 37, sorry, verse 37. So Joseph gives gives a bit of a lecture to Pharaoh about what he should do. Verse 37, This proposal pleased Pharaoh and all his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find a man like this in whom, the spirit of, in whom is the Spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has shown you all this, there is none so discerning and wise as you are. You shall be over my house, and all my people shall order themselves as you command. Only as regards to the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I've set you over all of the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand and clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. Isn't this an incredible situation that Joseph finds himself in? He, was suddenly, he went from prison, the lowest of the low, and suddenly he's thrust into a leadership position over all of Egypt. Now, what gave Pharaoh the confidence to put Joseph in this great position of power? Do you think maybe he did a bit of a background check? Possibly. Potiphar, do you know this person? Oh, yes, he used to be a slave of mine. What was he like? Well, I put him in charge of everything and everything went amazing. Right. Uh, prison guard, do you know this person? Yeah, yes, yes, he's a prisoner. What is he like? Well, he runs the prison. Right, I'm going to put him in charge of all of Egypt. The reason that Joseph was trusted with the signet ring of, of the Pharaoh was because he had been trustworthy as a slave and trustworthy in the cell. And it reveals to me that we can never underestimate the importance of a small task that God asks of us. Because it's those small tasks prepare us for what lies in the future. Patriarchs and prophets, and prophets again, it says, There are few who realize the influence of the little things of life upon the development of character. Nothing with which, with which we have to do is really small. Did you get that? Sometimes we think, oh, this is just a little task. But, but she says, nothing with which we have to do is really small. The varied circumstances that we meet day by day are designed to test our faithfulness and to qualify us for greater t trust. It reminds me of what Jesus said in the parable where he said, his master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Never underestimate the importance of a small task that God asks, you, asks of you. So what are the lessons we can get from the story of Joseph? Don't sell your brother. We've already learned that one. Okay? But what we've looked at through the message as well, we've looked at whatever situation you find yourself in, God has a plan for you. Is that encouraging? Number two, we represent Christ in everything that we do. If it's at school, in the workplace, at home, in the family, we are representatives of Christ. And we are influencing people towards God or away from Him. Number three, whether or not people see you is irrelevant if you are serving God. So let's make it our heart's commitment to whatever situation we are doing. Say, you know what? I know I'm working for this boss or I know I'm doing this homework for this teacher or I know I'm doing this for this person, but let's make God our Lord of our life. Number four, our experience is not a reliable measure of spiritual success. 
Isn't that good to know sometimes? When we end up in situations, we think, what did I do wrong? But maybe, like Joseph, you did what was right, and that's why you're in that situation. Number five, every situation is an opportunity to serve God. No matter where you are, no matter how insignificant your work seems, it's an opportunity to serve God. And never underestimate the importance of a small task. But if you forget all of these, remember the sermon of our message, which is do all that you do with all of your heart for God. But why should we? Why should we do all that we do with all of our heart for God? I want to read one more verse for you in this story, and it's found in chapter 41 and verse 46. Describing Joseph when he went into the palace, it says, Joseph was 30 years old when he entered the service of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. 30 years old when he entered into the greatest work of his life. Now, can you remember of anyone else who began their work at age 30? Okay, in the Gospel of Luke, it describes that it was about age 30 when Jesus began his public ministry. Now, that is not the only parallel between these two stories, but in fact, there is many, many parallels between the story of Joseph and the story of Jesus. Let's think about it. Joseph, he began in comfort, okay? With his, it was a pretty dysfunctional family, but he was there in a place of security with his father. He walked a downward path. He walked down to the, to the pit, to Potiphar, to the prison. He was condemned by the, his brothers, the very people that were supposed to love him. He was sold for just a few coins, stripped of his garment, falsely accused. He was innocent, but he was still condemned. He cared for two prisoners. This is Joseph we're talking about, the butler and the, and the baker. He was left for two years in the pit. He was raised to the position of power. And in that, pow- in that position of power, he was able to bring salvation by feeding the world. And he even fed his, en- his brothers who were his enemies. Does that sound like the story of Jesus? Jesus began in the comforts of heaven. He walked the downward path from heaven to being a human, to being a humble servant, to being hung on a cross. He was condemned by the very people that were supposed to love him. He was sold not for 20 coins, but for 30 coins. He was stripped of his garment. He was falsely accused. He was innocent but still condemned. He cared for the two prisoners that were on his left and his right. He was left in the pit of the tomb. He was raised to power with the resurrection. And as a result of sitting on the throne as King of kings and Lord of lords, he's able to bring salvation, not through food, but through forgiveness, to all corners of the world. And not just to his friends, but to his enemies as well. Why should we do all that we do with all of our heart for God? Because Jesus did all that he did with all of his heart for us. Father in heaven, we just thank you that you're a God who didn't just put half of an effort in, Lord, but you gave everything. You served us with all of your heart. And in response, you were murdered upon the cross. And so Jesus, So, Father, Lord, we thank you for the example of Jesus and we pray that the example of of Joseph and even more the example of Jesus would just stir our hearts in the coming week. May we go into our workplaces, into the schools where we are, into our families and do all that we do with all of our heart, not for just a human person, supervisor or boss or teacher, but for God. We pray that you'll... Help us to see the value in the little things. We pray that you will help us not to get discouraged when things go bad and not to um, yeah, get so discouraged that when we're, trying our, we're serving you with all of our heart and things go bad, help us to realize that that happened to you as well, Jesus. That when you served, when Jesus, when you served us with all of your heart, you ended up on the cross. And so I just pray that you'll help us to be more devoted than we've ever been before. Give us a zealousness and a passion and a zeal to go into our weeks. We pray in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.